Number four is up here at the front, uh, so please pick that up on your way out. Assignment five has been posted for a few days on the website now. As I mentioned in the class, in this time, it's an optional assignment. If you hand it in, you will drop the grade of your other lowest assignment or any other lowest assignment. If you don't um, choose to submit it, you'll just take the average of all your others of all the assignments. So one time, one time. Assignment five for you is an optional way um, to boost your grade for your assignment portion of your award. Everyone clear on that assignment? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, tutorial, as I get some feedback from your few classes ago, recall that uh, evaluation I asked you to fill in. There was a lot of good information that just coming back to that evaluation. Most of the things I saw there makes me feel happy that the course is on a good progress. People felt the class is going at the right pace. People felt that they had good access to the TAs. People felt the tutorials and assignments were helpful. The one request was though that the tutorials have solutions provided for them. And my thinking on the tutorials isn't that it's there for you to get solutions. My thinking on the tutorials is that you're there to actually make sure you solve the problem, understand the issues before you leave. If you just copy your buddy's results and hand in the same thing, you get your one point for the tutorial, but you've actually defeated the purpose of the tutorial for yourself. The purpose of the tutorial is for you to be there to stay and understand what's going on and leave and don't leave until you actually know what the concept is. So there's no reason to provide solutions because by the time you leave, you've got the solution already. And uh, we hand the tutorial sheet back to you. So we've been doing that now in the tutorials. So you'll be able to get the work back to practice building it. I want to get on that first. It isn't there for grades, it's there for you to have access to myself and the TAs to make sure the concepts are clear. My purpose, and I say this in all my courses, I don't care about grades, I care about your understanding the material. So if you leave before you understand the material or of your friends' work, you're not understanding the material. Okay? So you're defeating the whole purpose there. The last one is on the midterm. Midterm is on Thursday. Um, please take a look at the course website, all the details about the midterm location, the time, it's two hours, it's not an unlimited midterm, it's only two hours, it's the location and start time of the post on the website. The material in that midterm will be all the work in the course from the beginning till today's class, including today's class. Obviously the tutorial uh, the midterm will focus more on recent stuff, that's, that's implicit, however, you can't isolate the material we've covered in the last four weeks from the material we've covered in the first four weeks. So in a sense, then the midterm is on everything from the beginning till end of today's class. Same for the final exam. The final exam will be cumulative from the very first class till the very last class. Okay, so, so just bear that in mind for Thursday. Any questions before we get uh, started on today's topics? Yes, there is a good reason why the midterm is not unlimited. Uh, the unlimited midterm was an experiment that I've been running for the past two, three years. I've got all the data required now, and it's quite clear that having an unlimited time has no beneficial effect. If anything, the longer you stay, the worse your grade is. Okay. So, the statistics students in 4C3 have been analyzing that data. You guys have been analyze the same data set and you can see the results for yourself. There's no benefit from an unlimited midterm, indicating to me that whether you write for two hours, five hours, your grade is not going to change very much. So if you come unprepared to the midterm, you're going to still leave unprepared. Using the midterm to study and write your exam at the same time is not going to benefit you. That's pretty much the reason. Okay. Assignment 5 is due on Wednesday at class, no late hand-ins because I'll post the solutions that same day for you to study for Thursday. Okay, so let's take a look at where we were last time. Last time you had this handout um, available, it's also posted online if you don't have it with you today. But we were looking at these examples of identifying a model of a process so that we can then choose control. Everything we've done up to now in this course has assumed we know the model of the process. So if we look back at our diagram, we started with our set point, which we have compared to 
my control variable that comes back around. I design my controller GC of S. You know the PID controllers there for GC. My control system can be pretty complex. But this block here, yeah, this process block, is sort of left to first order models. So I've got a manipulated variable coming in, I've got a controlled variable leaving. What's inside here, we've always assumed we know it. So let's just put this in notation CV of MV, we call that GP of S. We've assumed we know GP of S in some way. We've derived that here from first principles models using ODEs and linearization. And we can get a pretty complex model over here, depending on the complexity of the process itself. And then we come back and then we've completed our loop. Last week, I showed you how we can find this model of the process without going to detailed mathematical models. And what we did, you'll recall, is we put a step change into the process, and then we observe the control variable. So in other words, we change my manipulated variable, and I watch what my controlled variable does. Now let's be clear of one thing I glossed over last week, and this is important. We assume that when we do that, that we're doing it with a <coughs> what we call open loop. In other words, if I make a change in the manipulated variable, I put a step input here in MV, and I watch what CV does, and CV may have that sort of first order response. <coughs> it's very clear that when I'm doing this, my loop is not in feedback mode. But if my loop were in feedback mode and I did this, this should start to change and come back to the set point. Okay, but what we do is, we go to our process, we turn on the control system, I change my manipulated variable, and I watch what my controlled variable does. And using these data, the MV and the CV, I can build a representation of what GP is without using first principles models. And the approach we used is to say, let's use that GP is a first order plus time delay model. So we say that's equal to KP e to the minus theta s of the tau s plus one. So we call that our first order plus time delay, so FOP. And for many processes, that's a great assumption to be using. So recall this example we looked at last Friday. I said, I'm going to change the flow rate of steam to my reboiler in a distillation column. So if I increase the steam going to the reboiler, let's remember we're at the bottom of the column now, adding more energy into the column, more steam flow, the temperature on the fourth tray from the bottom will rise. And in fact, you have that data in the handout there in front of you. And what it looked like is, if we run the simulation, um, we had something that looks as follows. So we started at 74 degrees Celsius, we rose to 85, 84 degrees Celsius, and what we did was we read off two points on that response curve. The time at 28% of the full rise and the time at 63%. If you're rising 10 degrees from 74 to 84, You'll, you guys found last Friday, find the point where you've risen 28%, find the point where you've risen 63%, read all those corresponding times on the horizontal axis, and we use that to calculate the first order of time delay coefficients. So let's just quickly look at why that works. I don't like to just show formulas and have you use them. Let's understand what's happened there. And I glanced over that last time, so I want to come back to that today. Why? So let's, uh, let's just draw what we did. Last time, this is also a good recap. From Friday, coming back here to Monday. So we said my manipulated variable, I'll make a step change up as follows. <coughs> that step, we said, occurs at time t0. My controlled variable, this was the messy plot that we created last Friday. My CV will then respond in a first order plus time delay manner, or should it respond in a first order plus time delay manner, we can use this approach. So let's take a look at what that should look like. Well, my CV is operating somewhere, and then at time T0, we make that change. 
we said last Friday that for a first order plus time delay model, we'll actually just keep going a horizontal line. That's my dead time theta. <coughs> for that duration of time theta, I will see actually no change in C. There's a pure dead time in my system. And then this rises in the first order manner. So that total rise, this distance here, we call delta. So capital delta is the total rise time. <coughs> we said last time that delta, capital delta is equal to kp times lowercase delta. Lowercase delta, you recall, was the amount by which we increased my manipulated curve. So theta then is that pure time delay. If we wait 63% of delta, so 63% of delta would be somewhere around here. So that's 0 0.63 delta. And we drop this down. And we drop that down. This distance over here, from when it starts to rise, so when it re reaches 63% of the rise time, that's my time constant tau. So it's, it's quite easy then to say T63 then, we recall the time from T0, when that step change, until when you reach 63%, that distance there, T63, is equal to theta plus tau. We can also derive T28. T28 is the time taken to reach 28% of the rise time. Well, let's go back and look at the equations for a first order process. For a first order process, we have a controlled variable and that is kp times delta. 1 minus e to the minus t minus theta over tau. T28 alpha by t28. Okay, so this was the, the theoretical response for the first order process. We spoke of that last time. And in fact, the reason why I want to recap this today is because we're going to start from this point and use this to check the points. That equation up there is going to be used to verify my model works, works well. So what you can do is if you sum in here C equals T plus tau, that's the point where you reach 63% of your rise. Well, how do you know that that's 63%? Sum that in. And this actually simplifies to kp times lowercase delta 1 minus e to the minus 1, which is equal to 0 0.63 times kp delta, or 0 0.63 uppercase delta. This is why it's 28%. Uh, so if we put in cb equals t plus 1 third of tau, so 1 third of the time constant, that gets you kp times lowercase delta 1 minus e to the minus 1 third, which is equal to 0 0.28. And so that's So in fact, we call t28, t28 is equal to the time to reach 28% of the rise. That happens to correspond to one third of the time So, time delay is around theta plus tau over the The reason why we've chosen that one third of the time constant and a full time constant, let's just take a look at this curve. That corresponds to 63% of the rise. This point over there corresponds to 28% of the rise. These two points are easy to find on a curve when there's noise. So if we look back at this plot we have on the board in front of us, 
the simulation. I've got a very noisy signal, but it's quite easy to find the 63 and the 28 percent points, even on a noisy signal, because at 28 percent and at 63 percent, that signal is rising quite rapidly. Okay, if I've chosen points that are close up, you know, let's say 90 percent, it's pretty hard to figure out when it's reached 90 percent because of all the noise. And if I've chosen a low value around 10 percent, it's also pretty hard to figure out where that might be with the noise. But 28 and 63, those are easy to locate even on a noisy signal, which is why we've chosen that. <coughs> so we went through that, that process last class, and I won't do it again. We did several examples, in fact, where we used this equation for 228. And here's the equation for T63. So there's the, the one equation. Here's the other equation. And take a look at those two equations. There's two equations in two unknowns, theta and tau. And if you solve two equations for two unknowns, you get the solution that we used on Friday. I just told you to use it as is. No one kind of questioned where this comes from. Well, now you know where it comes from. Those are the two equations in the two unknowns, and the solution of that set of equations is that tau is equal to 3 over 2 times t63 minus t. <coughs> and the second equation solution is theta is equal to t63 minus tau. So even though I told you just to use that on Friday, now you have an idea of where that comes from by solving those two equations in two elements. Okay, so let's step back and see what we've done. We know how to tune controllers now. We, we spent the past two weeks doing that, PID controllers. And based on Friday's class, we went through several examples of being able to estimate KP, theta, and tau, in other words, a process model. Those are really the two things you need to be a successful control engineer, to tune a simple single loop controller with one input and one output. So those are, that's really the core concepts of the course, single input, single output control system and being able to figure out KP, theta, and tau. You use that KP, theta, and tau then to find the PID controller to KC, TI, T. So that's, that's pretty much all it is related for single loop control. But one thing you should do is once you've got these values of KP, theta, and tau, you always check that it matches reality. So how do we do that? So we've gone to our distillation column and we've observed these data. If I go make a change in my steam flow rate, how do I know that the KP, theta, and tau that we got last time actually matches this process? So let's just put the numbers up here we got last class. If you check back in your notes from Friday, you'll see that we calculated KP was two and a half. We calculated that my daytime theta was 17, 17 minutes, and we calculated tau was 28 minutes. Okay, so if you didn't do that example in Friday's class, and you found it at home again, then you should be able to get values that are pretty similar to that. So now you're sitting at your desk, and you're wondering, are those good values? And the process we go use to check that is, we use this equation that's right up here. If I know Kp and I know theta and I know tau, if I go substitute into that equation, I should be able to match Cv. So Cv in this case corresponds to this yellow curve that's up here. So this is the data you went to your process and you measured by manually or using the temperature sensor on the 
code 6, you acquire that data, you should be able to predict this data with pretty good accuracy if your values of kp, theta, and tau are accurate. You also know delta, right? Because you went and changed your input, your mv by delta. So you know what delta is. So we know all the four coefficients in that equation. It should match and predict quite well. So let's go check how we do that. Well, in the spreadsheet, I'll share the spreadsheet on the course website with you. We simply go take our raw data that's in blue over here, and we overlay our predictions, which is the red curve. <coughs> so the first two columns, that's the time data. So I use this as equally spaced points in time, so one minute, two minutes, and so forth. The temperature, these were the data you measured from the process. So you go, your, therm your thermocouple is on the process, and you go to your computer database afterwards, and get those first two columns. So that's, that's easy to get. The next column is the predicted temperature. And what that is, is simply, I've used this equation, you may see it up here or down here. Sub this equation into Excel, you can look up there, or those of you in the front might see it clearly down here. That equation then is exactly Kp times delta, one minus e to the minus t, minus theta over tau. So sum in your values that you estimated using this method we showed on Friday. And if that red curve matches the blue curve to good accuracy, you're, you're set. Then you know that you've done a reasonable job. Okay. So I've got slightly different values in here, 28 and 24. I had said to you it was 17 for theta. Change that to 17. Tau is 28. You can try different values and see more or less how that curve changes and matches. And one thing you should plot is the error. So plot the error between KP and, sorry, the error between your actual CV and your predicted CV. And this should be pretty much randomly above and below if you've got good estimates. Can you scroll to the um, like, something over my Could you turn that back to 17? So, so change your, your, you can fine tune your parameters afterwards. Remember when you're reading off this curve, it's very subjective. Remember in the class on Friday we had ranges of answers that were about 10, 10 minutes difference. Right? So always go back and overlay your data on the raw original data to verify. That's the final check. I didn't cover that on Friday's class, so that's why I'm just pointing it out now. Everything clear on that? checking your, your answers. <coughs> okay, so now let's take a look at some shortcomings of this process. We've, I proposed a method to you, but it's got some shortcomings that you should be aware of. The first is if you've got this page here in front of you, flip over and there's three graphs in the back that I'd like us to take a look at.
okay, here's why we cannot use this data. Everyone agree we cannot use it? Why do you say we could? Why do you think you could use it? But initially, many of you thought you could use it. Looks nice, looks first order, right? It looks like it should be valid for what our approach is. But here's one reason why we cannot. This input in blue was not done appropriately. The input in blue is this manipulated variable. The manipulated variable must be stepped, stepped up. Here, putting in a smooth change in the manipulated variable that slowly opens the valve to the new value. The beginning is okay, the end is okay, but this middle part is not okay. <coughs> you must, when you make this change, open that valve as rapidly as you possibly can. Not slowly open, 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 open. Okay, so this change should be as step-like as you can possibly make it. Now, obviously, in reality, we won't quite get a perfect step. There will be a little bit of a curvature over there, but you should make it as step-like as possible. That's how we derive the equations for T63 and T28. So if our input doesn't match our assumptions for this input-output graphs over here on the blackboard, then we're going to overestimate values of theta on this curve. The theta we're going to estimate on this curve is not going to be correct. But the only value that will be correct on this curve is which one? Theta, kp, or tau. Which of those will be correct if you use that data? Kp, KP your input output. So kp is, remember, lowercase delta here on the blue curve, and uppercase delta is this change over there. Okay, so those two numbers will be correct. Lowercase delta, uppercase delta, therefore kp will be correct. But tau and theta will not be correct in this data. So you can Rescue a little bit of the value from this data set, but you've lost a lot of value by doing that thing on the Can we use this data? So your operator's gone and made a change in the manipulated variable, and we've observed that output. Yeah. People are shaking their heads. No, what feels wrong about that? What's too small? So step inputs. Okay, so it's, the step input might be okay, but the noise we're observing in the response swamps any value that might be there. We can see that it sort of rises a little bit, right? But you can never find T63 and T28 on this, right? T63 and T28 are not able to be located in this data. So here's the rule of thumb. Signal to noise must exceed five. What do we mean by signal to noise must exceed five? Well, if we go, and check our distillation data. So flip over the page that you're writing on now. Go back to that second graph at the bottom. In other words, go back to this curve that I had up here. What is the noise in that system? values at around 84 and a half, 85 degrees, sorry, 85 and a half to about 82 degrees, we've got about two to three units of noise. Okay. We've got a pretty noisy signal over there. What's my signal? Ten. Okay. My signal is is about ten units. Good identifiable part of this graph is that I started at 74, ended up at 75. There's a range there of about 10 units. The signal to noise here is pretty, we're right on that bound of five. 10 signal units, two noise units, we're right at that bound. Okay, so this is reasonable values. You can 
locate T63 and T28 from this graph. If this step was smaller, let's say we didn't steady out at 84, but let's say we steadied out here at 78, 80 degrees minutes, we probably wouldn't be able to figure out where T63 and T28 are. So T63 and T28 can be found when certain degrees exceed 5 degrees. So that's where that rule of thumb comes from. But don't treat it as, a, as an absolute requirement. If your signal to noise is 4, go for it. Like you're not going to repeat your work. What's up with this one? Can we use this data? Stepping down, we should get exactly the same result. So you have a step down, I get a little bit of time delay the process stays up. So you can't go kick if you the time in the second. So in fact, this is a great experiment because you get to calculate KP, fat, theta, and tau twice. One stepping up and one stepping back down again. This is in fact the advisable way to do this work. Step up and then step down again. You get two estimates of Kp, two tiles, two thetas. Okay. But what, what's there bothering you about this plot? Assuming that things will be the same, my things will be about the same level, that I have okay. 70 or so. Shouldn't we have come back down to the same level? Okay, because if I step up by small delta units, I should get a response of capital delta. If I step down by minus delta, lowercase delta, I should drop down by minus delta again. I have not steadied out at the same point where I started off. I should have steadied out roughly at this point over here. Okay. So I did not observe that. So in fact, my second estimate of Kp is going to be different than the first estimate of Kp, significantly different. So what's going on in, in this process? Something's happened here that we should be aware of. <laughs> Let's take a look at that. The idea of the third, for example. Yep. So that's it. So let's take a look at, I'll give you an example of how you might see this in practice. So let's take a different example. We're tired of mixing hot and cold water, so let's do something different here. We're going to take a tank with the jacket, and we're putting steam in that jacket to heat the contents of the tank. There's my CSTR, there's a jacket around the CSTR. I'm putting into the jacket steam at a certain flow rate. <coughs> and I've got a valve that I can use to change that flow of steam to the jacket. The steam swirls around the jacket and then leaves over there at some lower temperature having exchanged heat with the tank. When that steam comes in at some temperature, let's call it T-steam. So 
get my reaction going, my CSTR, I've got to flow into the tank. <coughs> there's a flow in. And there's a temperature coming into the tank. So this is going to be an endothermic reaction. They say that's why we're providing the steam so the endothermic reaction takes place. Leaving my tank then is the final product, T, at some temperature T, and at some flow rate. So T over here is my temperature. That's what I'm interested in controlling. This is my control variable. Okay, we want that temperature to always occur at the same temperature T, and I'm going to manipulate my flow rate of steam change my steam flow rate up, the temperature in my tank will go up. Change the steam flow rate down, temperature drops. There's a cause and effect relationship there. I can use this as a manipulated variable and a controlled variable pair. So MV, CV pairing works for the system. And let's say this process has some flow F out that goes down stream to packaging. And my packaging unit is taking the flow of the liquid out of this tank. And in order to run the packaging line, there's some sort of feedback controller further downstream. I don't show it, I don't see it. But this controlled variable in another loop is going to manipulate this flow rate out. It's going to adjust flow higher and lower depending on its requirements. So I've got several disturbances in the system. <coughs> when we're doing this test, remember we take that manipulated variable, steam, F steam, and what we're going to say is change F steam in a step-like manner. And then observe this temperature over here. over there, my control variable will have some sort of delay and then it will start to rise. So there will be some initial delay here depending on the piping and how much it has to move through the jacket. There's going to be some delay before I see that ramp up in temperature. Okay, so that's what this first half of the graph is. So up to time 40 minutes, things are going as planned it drops down. I drop my steam flow rate back down now. And while I'm doing that, my disturbance hits me. And there could be any number of disturbances. For example, T in could have changed. F in could have changed. The temperature of the steam could have changed. This flow rate over here the demand from the downstream line for the packaging could have changed. Any one of those red circle disturbances might have changed, causing the system to actually have a different behavior. And so when I drop that steam flow rate down, I don't settle out where I started. I settle out somewhere else. So while I've been running this experiment, the disturbance has come in and hit me. And I'm going to get the different results. So what do we do? Now we know this problem exists. What are we going to do as engineers about it? If the drop goes lower than or always lower than the starting point, or could it higher than it could be it depends on the nature of the disturbance. If temperature rose over here, now I'm putting more heat into the system. So in fact, this won't drop as much. This will drop by a lower amount. <coughs> if this temperature had gone down, we're going to see this have come down like that. So it totally depends on the disturbance. So what are we going to do as engineers? This is a this is an annoying problem. How can we solve this? Suggestions. Controller tuning for disturbances. So a controller tuning for disturbances requires KP theta et tau. Multiple scenarios of or just, just like try it Okay, repeat the experiment at a different time of the day. Any other suggestions? But, 
the temperature could be either higher or lower. Um, so you're just you're changing the you never get a steady Right. Your disturbances are always changing. And you may not even, here we've got one, two, three, four disturbances that we can measure. But there's disturbances we cannot measure that will impact the process. So for example, this is an endothermic reaction. There might be impurities in your raw material. I don't know how much impurities in my raw material. More impurities means the reaction goes to less completion, less heat is required. There's many disturbances that we cannot measure, but there's also many disturbances we can measure. So we've got this problem, what do I do? Mark's on the right track. We do many experiments. What we do in practice is we'll never do one of these. We'll do many of them. What we'll do is we'll go to our process and my manipulated variable over time, I will simply do step up, step down, step down, up, <coughs> wait for some random period of time, step up, step up, step up, step down. So put in a totally random sequence of ups and downs. And my controlled variable then might respond as follows. It will start to rise, steady out, then fall, then steady out, then rise, then fall, then rise, then fall, then rise, then fall. I may not have it quite synced up, but you get the idea. It's that I now have one, two, three, four, five, six times. One, two, three, four, five, six occasions to estimate KP, theta, and tau. And if I do this over a 24-hour period, I'm just simply getting an average KP, an average theta, and an average tau that works across most disturbances. Now we have a name for this type of signal. We call this the PRBS. So you may see this in practice. It's a pseudo-random. Kind of, it's a simulated random binary sequence. PRBS. Binary refers to the, the levels up and down. Pseudo binary random sequence. And we do this to mitigate the effect of disturbances. to just point out one other disadvantage of this approach that we've mentioned so far. So the final disadvantage is, let's just uh, make a note here, this method we've been looking at now is called the reaction curve, the process reaction curve method. So the method we have used is called the process reaction curve method. The main drawback, why your boss might never let you do this in practice, is it requires you to operate the process in open. requires you to operate the process in open loop. It requires you to turn off 
the existing control system. Okay, so in the past, or up to this point, before you do the experiment, you have a controller in place. So you've got this manipulated variable and that control variable are normally operating what we say is in closed loop. There's constant feedback. When you do this experiment, this process reaction curve technique to calculate what KP theta and tau is, you have to open the loop. No one likes to open a loop that's normally in feedback. Okay. In a chemical process or in other processes, Unless you're sure that you can guarantee the safety of the system and the safety of the people around you, you don't go around opening loops. In other words, you don't go turn the feedback controller off. The feedback controller is there to keep things operating in safe conditions, close to the desired point of operation that's producing optimal products. So if you go turn the feedback controller off and a disturbance comes into the process while you're working on this experiment, your process is going to react. And because you've got the manipulated variable disconnected, remember you've got the manipulated variable disconnected because you're doing this. Right? So you're, you're telling the, the controller, I'm going to control the MV. The controller normally sets what MV is. You're now controlling MV and making a step up and then a step down. If a disturbance comes in while you've got the system in manual mode, you better be able to switch it to automatic pretty quickly, okay? If it can cause damage. So we don't like to go do this to processes. But the process reaction curve method requires it. What you will learn about if you, if this is an area that any of you end up working in, is that there's techniques to do what you call closed loop identification. So maybe a new term for you that you haven't seen, but you might hear of in the future, we call identification. Identification is the process of finding out what is KP, tau, and theta. In fact, that's exactly what we've been doing in the past two classes, is what's called identification. And a professor here at back in the 1970s developed the techniques to do what we call closed loop identification, which is you never have to take the controller offline into manual mode. While the process is running in automatic, you can still control the process. And in fact, all that the technique, not all of the technique, but one of the insights of the technique is it simply says, you see this PRVS, simply add that your control system while it's running in automatic mode. So superimpose that into your signal and you can still find the process. So that's a graduate school topic, but it's good for you guys to know that it basically comes here. Okay, so, so we went to this class for a new time.